Hi everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Um, it is my pleasure to announce Dickie George, who comes to us from the uh, Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University, and before that was several years as a mathematician at the NSA. He's going to be talking to us about the role of the NSA in the development of DES. Um, I could probably introduce myself as well. I'm Lauren Stewart. I'm just the president of, com of the Sirius Student Association, who uh, is a sponsor of this talk. We're really glad to have all of you here. Um, and without any further ado, I will let Dickie take it away. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm sorry. I do have one more thing to say. If you have questions, he's perfectly willing to take them during the talk. Um, we have this microphone, which I'll be walking around. We have this microphone back here so that your questions can be uh, recorded so that they will be available for all posterity. So yeah. keep that in mind when you're asking questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's important it's just being recorded. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> so uh, f for me, it, it, this sounds loud to me. Is this too loud or is it okay? Okay. So for, for me, this, uh, st this talk started back in 2010. Um, I was talking to uh, a gentleman from RSA at, at, in 2010, and he was saying next year's RSA conference is the 20th anniversary. It would be nice if we had something big. Now, coincidentally, I was planning to retire in 2011, and uh, so I used that as an excuse to talk to the director and say, we ought to declassify the whole DES story. And he said, that's, that's a good idea. We ought to. Now, the, the reason I wanted to do it was DES was back in 72, and it turns out that I was the last person at NSA who had played any role in that, who had, who had participated in the evaluation. And I knew if I retired before it was declassified, it was never going to get out, because it was, a, it was a pretty quiet story all through its life. So this gave me an opportunity to do that. Uh, and that, that was kind of fun. This is the third time I've given the talk. I gave it at RSA. And I gave it once in a class, but this one's being recorded, and I think that's really nice. It's nice to, to, to have this for history. So please do ask questions. Now, I'll, I'll also tell you that when I, when I did this talk at RSA, I did it on a, wen, on a Wednesday or Thursday, but during the keynotes, the Tuesday keynotes, they had a panel, a 45-minute panel on this story where it was just question and answers the panel. I was on the panel, and there were four public cryptographers who were asking questions. Uh, that, that tape is still available on YouTube if you want to see it. It's pretty interesting. Uh, the, the four public guys are probably people you know. It was uh, Whit Diffie and uh, Marty Hellman, Adi Shamir, and Ron Rivest. So they were guys who had been involved in, in the game. And they were friends of mine. It was a, it was a, it was a fun panel. The, the unfun part of it was when they announced it. As soon as they announced it, all four of them started sending me the questions on emails, hoping I would answer them before the panel. And I had to keep telling them, I'm not going to answer the questions before we do it live. You know, it's it's got to be spontaneous. I can't be giving you guys all the answers up front. So, uh, and of course, Hellman said back, but I've been waiting 30 years, and I may die before this panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. But uh, it, it was fun. So uh, now let me set the stage a little bit for what's going on back in the 70s. Uh, for, for a lot of you, the world was different back then. Uh, you're not, not familiar with the story at all. In uh, 1972, crypto was not a commercial thing. There were a few companies, mostly European, that were doing things not well. They basically were doing the same thing they'd been doing in World War II. The real crypto was being done by governments around the world. And nobody else got to play. So that, that was the state of the art. At the same time, if, if you look at the, what was going on in the world, I, I worked in the Information Assurance Directorate at NSA. Uh, by the way, a few years was 41, so it was really a few years. Um, at that point in time, the Information Assurance Directorate, which had about 2,500 people that were doing this evaluation of crypto and implementation of crypto, that director did not own a computer. We were doing the work with, with paper and pencil. And then you know, about 72, 73, uh, we got a line over to another building where we could borrow some time on another part of the agency's computer. 
And so you could read your cards in, and you got to run a program a day. And of course, there were about seven cards up front that were control cards. And if you got any one of those wrong, you didn't get to run anything that day. And that was the way it went. So it was a very much different world. In about 1972, someone decided that the commerce is going to, it's going to be using computers. We need to have some kind of encryption to protect that information. Now at the same time, I was sitting at my desk in 1973 when the Director of Information Assurance at, at NSA walked by my desk and said, what are you working on? And I said, I'm working on a computer cryptographic algorithm. He said, what? And I said, well, it's, it's going to be an encryption algorithm that's designed to run in software. He said, okay, okay. Uh, don't spend more than 10% of your time on that because we will never run crypto in software. You can't trust computers. And that was, that was the world back then. So when they told uh, NBS, the National Bureau of Standards, which is now NIST, that we need an algorithm for commercial use to protect the information, the first thing they did was come to NSA and say, w would you design us an algorithm? There was a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion at all the levels at NSA. Uh, at my level, I was, I was in 72, I was younger. And, uh, the, a lot of the discussion was technically, could we do it and, and how would we do it? At the more senior levels, the questions were, if we put out an algorithm, no one's going to use it because they think it's going to be hooked. If anybody finds an attack on it, they're going to know we hooked it, even, even if we didn't. So th this politically is going to be a disaster for us no matter what way we go. If, if you think about the world of crypto back then, we designed things like, like Vinson. Vinson's a handheld radio that a Forbes observer uses. It's got an algorithm in it. The algorithm was designed in 1957. We evaluated it for 12 years to ensure that there was nothing that could go wrong. Then we implemented it, and we looked at that implementation. And when I said we looked at that implementation, I spent six months with the engineering diagrams for that thing, failing every resistor, every gate, every register stage, every breaking every line to see what could go wrong. And anything serious that went wrong, we put an alarm in so that it, it would be caught if it happened. So, so well, we actually fielded that in 1976. So it took 19 years from design to fielding. It's still out in the field. So it's been 40 years. It's never had anything changed, and it's never had a problem. Unlike an operating system, which changes every Tuesday. So it was a different world. But that 12 years of evaluation of the logic, we relied on that to make sure we weren't missing anything. And when NBS said, we're going we're gonna to put this out in a year, we, we were nervous that, that we would design something and there would be a problem with it. So the agency said, we, we don't want to design the algorithm. Now, when we said we don't want to design the algorithm, there were big equities concerns. And equities are, are balancing the offense and the defense. So everybody thinks crypto variable size when, when you think of equity concerns. That wasn't it. Because the offense wanted a 16-bit variable, and nobody was going to buy that. Right, because that, that's a joke. So that wasn't the concern. What, what the offense really wanted was they wanted to make sure that we weren't teaching the world how to make good crypto. They weren't worried about us teaching the Russians how to make good crypto. They were worried about us teaching the world how to make good crypto. And that was the big concern. And that, that was, you know, if you fast forward to skipjack days, that, that's where we, that, that, uh, rose again from the dead, that, that same concern. So it was decided that we would not design the algorithm, but the director told the director of, of NIST, who was MBS at the time, told him that yes, we will evaluate the algorithm that is proposed to make sure 
that there's not anything there as far as we can tell. And again, it was only going to be a one-year valuation, but we will evaluate it to make sure that there's no weakness there. And we'll tell you if we find anything. And the director of NSA said, I want to be able to assure the director of NIST that the algorithm is as strong as advertised, that there aren't shortcut attacks that we find. So if we find anything, we are going to tell them. So those, those are the ground rules we're playing under at that point in time. Now, uh, NIST put out a call for one of these algorithms, an algorithm that could be used as a data encryption standard. And they got three submissions. All were from professors that wanted uh, a lot of money to study the problem. And of course, the director of NBS said, that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an algorithm. And so we looked around and looked around, came back to NSA and said, can't get one. Can you design one? So we went through the same discussion again. Will we do it? What's it going to look like? Uh, there were a lot of discussions inside about what it should look like. And, and as we were in the middle of those discussions, someone found out that IBM was working on an algorithm that they were plan to com planning to commercialize. It was called Lucifer. Yeah, it was going to go out. And the, uh, the main designer of that algorithm was a, was a gentleman who had worked in the Army Security Agency and had worked on crypto with NSA. So there was a feeling that he actually knew what he was doing and this might be a decent algorithm. They went, they went to uh, IBM and talked to them and IBM agreed to give up their commercial plans to donate the algorithm to the government for non-national security use. And they would, they would put it into the competition. So NBS put out another call. And they got th three more applicants. One, another professor who asked for a lot of money to study the problem. Uh, they got a company that said they would allow NBS to use their algorithm, but they wanted it to remain proprietary so no one would know what it looked like. And they wanted to charge for use. NBS said that's not really what we had in mind when we were looking for a data encryption standard. It really has to be visible to the public so that the public can evaluate it. And the, the third was Lucifer. So Lucifer went in and uh, they, t they talked to the director once again. He set up similar ground rules. He said, okay, we are going to evaluate this. We're going to uh, look at it, see if there's any attack that's uh, short of exhaustion. We're going to tell you if, we ha if it doesn't meet its advertised strength. And we won't make, any ch we won't make we won't su or suggest any changes unless they are critical to the security. So if we find an attack, we'll tell you, we'll, we'll tell IBM, and we'll work with them to fix it. If we don't find an attack, we won't make any changes. Sounds pretty fair. And then they set up the most convoluted evaluation system you can imagine. Uh, they set up one small team of people to work with IBM to give them any information they might ask. And they were told, any question that IBM asks, you answer it. Okay, so you've got to be completely honest with them. And they, they cleared the people at IBM so that they could get that information if it, if it needed to be classified. They set up a team of people to evaluate the, the algorithm, a smallish team. And everyone knew that those teams existed, the, the evaluation team and the, and the team that worked with IBM. Shortly after that, they set up a shadow evaluation team to, to do an evaluation. It was a team that nobody knew about. Now, I was on the shadow. I was actually on the first team. As, as a bit player, but I was on the shadow team as, as you know, make, make sure we really don't miss anything. It's funny, when, when I was getting ready to give this talk, I was uh, talking to my best friend at NSA who I'd worked with virtually every day for 35 years until he retired. Really worked with him closely every day. And I was talking about giving this uh, talk and, and he said, oh, do you want my notes? <laughs> 
he said, do you want my notes? And I said, your notes, you never worked on DES. He said, oh yeah, I was on the shadow team that was watching your team. You just didn't know there was another team that existed. Now, I don't know how many shadow teams there were watching those <laughs> other teams. But it seems like everybody was involved and nobody knew it. So it was a crazy system. But uh, when, when we worked with IBM, we gave them, everybody knows what DES looks like. It's got a, it's got a bit permutation, it's got S-boxes. The S-boxes are little. Each S-box has four permutations on the number from 0 to 15. So we gave them eight criteria to generate those S-boxes. There was a ninth criteria that IBM didn't know about. And that was, the, that was the criteria to block differential cryptanalytic attacks because differential cryptanalysis was classified at the time. So what we said was we generate a bunch of S-boxes and then we'll help you pick the set. Now what our plan was was to see which of these thousand permutations that they submitted satisfied that ninth criteria. And we just say, let's use these. Seems pretty reasonable. The problem is that ninth criteria was really, really tricky. It was any single bit in has to, has to go to at least two bits out. At least one of those bits has to be on the outside So because the outside bits get spread over and have more influence and blah, 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 blah. And asking that to happen for every single one bit off put too much restriction on those little permutations. Little permutations are funny anyway. If you show anybody a little permutation, he's going to find all sorts of things that look non-random because the human eye just does that. So we took all of the permutations that IBM had given us and couldn't find any that met, that met the ninth criteria. So uh, the, the team that was working with IBM generated permutations that met all nine criteria, gave them back to IBM and said, let's use these. We didn't know if IBM would notice that those were not permutations that they'd given us or not. Because they gave us lots and lots of these little permutations. Could have, could have been a set from that. But someone did. And uh, someone actually said that we, you know, we got these permutations back from NSA, and they were all changed. We don't know what happened. Well, when they announced that, the world immediately assumed that's where the hook was. NSA had planted a hook in that permutation. Now, when I say the world, it wasn't everybody. Adi Shamir told me that he never believed we hooked it because he knew we wanted to read Russian, email, Russian mail, and the Russians weren't going to use it. So why would we bother to, to, to hook it? And in some sense, that's true. I've got a lot of stories about funny things that happened with Adi. We had some good times over the years. But uh, this, was, this was not a bad thing from an NSA point of view because there was no hook in those S-boxes. They, they, were, they were there to block that attack. And it was much better for us in two ways to have people think that that's where the hook was. Because it meant the only people that were probably going to use it were the, the commercial people in the US who were being, going to be forced to use it. The, the world wasn't going to use it. Second, it was much better for us to have people looking at those permutations, trying to figure out what the trap door is, rather than figuring out why we used those to make it stronger. Much better for them to try to attack them than, than to think what, what were they doing. So that worked out pretty well. Now, um, one of the questions that, that Marty asked was, why didn't you change the key schedule? The key schedule is way too simple. He said, yeah, I spent months on that key schedule. And my answer was, yeah, I spent years on that key schedule. You spent months. If I had been able to find anything wrong, because that looked to me like it was way weak. It looked like it was way too simple. If I could have found the hint of an attack, I could have fixed it. But the ground rule said that if we couldn't find an attack, we couldn't change anything. 
So I think it was Tuchman said, you know, when, when it came back, they hadn't changed a wire, they hadn't changed a line, they hadn't changed anything. And that's really true. We hadn't changed any wires. We hadn't changed the permutation. We hadn't changed the key schedule. We hadn't done anything. All we did was the, was the S-boxes. Now, uh, the, other, the other big issue, of course, was the 56 bits of crypto variable. That was an information assurance equity. So back in the 50s, we were trying, we, the, one of the things that they did when they set up NSA was they said, we don't want to be caught in the situation that the Germans were caught in World War II, where they knew there was an attack on Enigma, but they didn't think that anybody would spend the money to build anything to exploit it. We don't want to fall prey to that. And so uh, Jim Fraser developed something that was akin to Moore's law to, to predict where technology was going to go in the future. Uh, he did it a little bit at a finer granularity because different technologies evolve at, at different rates. So, so there were things that were happening like tape readers we used to use. Well, you could predict what was going to happen with tape reader technology. That was a, that was a big cost for us. It could get better but it wasn't going to get better forever. And so the improvement was going to, going to tail off. You were only going to get so much better, things like that. So we had something, that we had standards that would tell us how good things had to be. And we knew what we were requiring of communication systems that the government was using. Now, remember, when we did Vincent, we evaluated that algorithm for 12 years, and then we evaluated the implementation for another seven. The, that implementation is so critical because that's what you're usually attacking. You're usually attacking an implementation, not, not, the, not the, the algorithm itself. It's pretty easy to find the problem with the algorithm. It's really hard to find a problem with the implementation because implementations change. I remember one time when we were looking at that, uh, at that handheld thing, and, and we had a uh, we had n, n clocks of delay built in, built in in one place. And when we went to test it, we got n plus 1. And we're thinking, what, what the heck? How does that happen? Well, it happens because the blasted wire was too long. It slowed down the signal enough that, we, that it built in another delay bit for us. And so we had to change the whole design because that, that was the first implementation. You had to build that in, or you were never going to get another one that had that extra delay bit, because times were going to change. Those are the kind of things you need to worry about. Another thing, another interesting thing that happened, we had, to, we had another line that was long. Well, the signal was, was kind of dying out, so we had to put an amplifier on it. The guy who built it, the company that built it, found they could buy amplifiers with, a, with an inverter cheaper than they could buy amplifiers, and so they used those. So suddenly we got an inverter in the middle of our machine that we weren't expecting. You got to know about those things. And, and sometimes those things matter. Like if you're adding A to A plus B plus C in an implementation, you never add A plus B plus C back in the old days. You add A to B, and then you take that sum and add it to C. If you take A plus B plus C, it's different than if you take A plus B plus C. When you go through and look at the failure things that can happen, it's a different case. And we, we had to throw a whole series away one time because they decided, well, that we'll just add B to C first instead of A to B first. You can't, you can't make changes like that. So the implementation is so critical. You got to worry about that. that. That's what we knew was going to be attacked. So when we were looking at this algorithm, we said, if we put a lot of crypto variable in here, we know what's going to happen. The military is going to say, I can buy those DES boxes cheap. I'm going to start using those. And we had no idea what the implementation was going to be. So the director of information assurance said, make that crypto variable small enough that the military won't be allowed to use it. The, direct, the director said, I, I got to make it secure. I can't, I can't be playing around like that. So um, I actually found meeting notes from a meeting that, that were only two people in, two people plus an exec. 
because neither of the two were going to take notes on anything. They had to have somebody who recorded what was going on. But uh, Jim Fraser and the director got together, and the, the director said, how big do I have to make it to be safe into the future? And this was, remember, this was early 70s. And Jim Fraser said, to go out to 1990, you need 56 bits. But then you've got to, de you've got to decertify it at 1990, because in 1991, it's going, to be, it's going to be attackable. So the director called up the director of, of NBS and said, we want to go 56 bits. It's going to give you until 1990. The director of NBS said, we're only going to use DES for three or four years, and then we'll replace it with the next version. Sure, that's fine. He didn't understand how, how hard it was going to be to change that thing out. So that's where the 56 bits came from. Now, there's another thing that happened. That's parity bits. And parity bits came because of, of, again, of an IED thing. See, we were used to dealing with the military. Military guys are out in the field. It's muddy. It's raining. It's all sorts of crap. And the way they put crypto variables in, they have a, a piece of paper, a strip of paper, that they pull through a little machine, a key reader. It's got a metal comb in there that picks up the holes in the paper tape, tells it what the variable is. Doesn't always work real well. In fact, a lot of times it doesn't work real well. So they added parity on. The reason they added parity on, if you do that, the machine will tell you it didn't pass parity. Try again. You don't want to put the wrong crypto variable in. If you, if you put the wrong crypto variable in, encrypt a message, send it out, you're going to get a note back in, in, in the clear saying, hey, I can't understand you. So you try again, and you send the same message out with a slightly different variable. That's a very bad situation. We didn't want to fall prey to that. So we routinely added parity bits to make sure that the thing had loaded right. Now, it's a little bit different working in a bank than, than working out in the field. So we probably been, would have been OK without it. But that's, that's where those bits of parity came from. Um, it's just tradition. So at this point in time, we went out with a 56-bit version 56 bits also happened to fall nicely inside the range of what we knew differential cryptanalysis could do. Because we, you know, we, we were looking at this, and, and I had a path that took it down to just about 56. And so I, I could tell the director, I'm pretty happy about this. Because it looks like you're going to be able to say, yes, it meets its advertised strength. Whereas if, if you made it big, yeah, you're all familiar with differential cryptanalysis. A complicated uh, crypto variable schedule wouldn't help you much with differential cryptanalysis, but you're looking for some kind of structure. You'd usually do something like say, you know, I'm going to assume a little bit of crypto variable, go in, find, it, find these kinds of things, and go back and look for the structure at the end. Or you can start with structure at the beginning, go down, uh, assume some variable down here, back up, see if the structure exists. So you're not, you're not making tons of variable assumptions. The complicated mixing of crypto variable wouldn't have helped you a whole lot. So. At that point in time, it looked like everything was good. We had the world was sure that we had hooked the thing through the S-boxes. And so there, there, were, there were papers coming out left and right about so, you know, Some guys would even say, it's, it's S-box 6 that they hooked. Here's how it works. And you're thinking, really? <laughs> you know, If you're going to tell me this is where it is, you've got to tell me what the attack is. Don't just tell me it's got to be this S-box. And so, you know, I, so, when I looked at some of those S boxes, they really looked bad. And we were pretty happy that they looked that bad because what a target that was for the world. I mean, if the world is telling everybody don't trust this thing, that's great. Uh, Marty Hellman had a, had a nice piece of work on his uh, mem memory trade off, time memory trade off. That was, it was great work. Uh, it gave people a lot of opportunity to do some really neat things. Now, that's the reason that this was such a critical point in the development of cryptography for the world. What made NSA the leader in cryptography was we had the best problems. Right? We, we had the best designers in the world, and we were looking at their crypto and trying to find problems with it. Nobody had those kind of problems to work on. That was awesome. 
we also had a critical mass of people. We had a thousand mathematicians looking at these problems and sharing the information with each other every day. So the best problems and a critical mass of people thinking about it. That's how you own the space. And we did own it. What we did with DES was we gave the world a problem to concentrate on. And then the internet popped up, ARPANET. And that gave the world virtual critical mass. I, I remember I was, uh, I was having dinner with Adi Shamir one time, and we were, I was talking about, about his work. And he hauls out his laptop and says, let me show you my emails from the 70s. And so we started going through his, e he still had his emails from the 70s when he had worked on this stuff sitting there. Um, what wasn't real emails, because I think the real email didn't start until about 91 or something like that. But, but it was notes that they were sending back and forth. So, th so that was fun stuff, really fun stuff. And then you know, we, we had differential analysis not because of DES. We had it because of other algorithms that it worked on. And then we could apply it to DES. You, you're never going to find differential cryptanalysis by looking at DES. It just doesn't work. So the, the, uh, the Japanese published an algorithm called FEEL in the 80s. And uh, Adi looked at that. And he had this idea of looking at differences to see what would happen. And he tracked it through. And he figured out what differential cryptanalysis would do by looking at feel. He found that it, it just destroyed feel. So he said, boy, I wondered what that would do on DES. This should work on DES. So he started looking at DES. And he kept applying it. And he just couldn't find a good path through. And it drove him nuts. He said, these S boxes just don't let my paths work. And they, they all were coming, you know, everything he tried would be 56 or, or worse. The best he could find was 56. And, and he said, you know, they changed the S boxes, I wonder. So he generated about 10 sets of random S boxes and tried them in DES. And he got work factors on every one of them between 2 to the 16th and 2 to the 32. So every random set that he tried, his differential cryptanalytic attack worked really well. So I remember the uh, word came out in 89 that Shamir was going to announce some DES work. He didn't say he was going to announce an attack. He said he was going to announce some DES work. Now, I, kn I knew what he had done on field. And so the guess was it was differential cryptanalytic. All I was hoping was he didn't find a better path than I had, because I was going to be screwed if he had. <laughs> so when his work came out, in fact, he had found the best path that we had. It was really cool. But in his paper, when he talked about this, this path, and he talked about how it works so much better on every other S-Box, he presented him and showed how well it worked, he hypothesized that there was a ninth criteria that wasn't divulged to the public and blocked differential cryptanalysis, which was exactly right. But of course, that was published in 1990. And as he did that, we announced that DES was no longer certified for use. So the whole thing played itself out really beautifully, just at the time when, when it was announced that NSA had been good guys and had blocked an attack rather than putting in an attack. It, it became attackable in real life. The timing was perfect. The analysis was beautiful. I remember Adi, Adi was giving a talk. When I talked at RSA, Adi gave a talk the next day about public cryptanalysis of DEA, the public role. And he was talking about his relationship with NSA, how he used to send letters to the director with his ideas on crypto. And the director would send him back nice letters. Now, the director wasn't sending him letters. He was signing the letters. But, 
But all of the outside crypto stuff was coming to me. And uh, most of it w was what you might expect it would be. But sometimes you get somebody like, like a, a Shamir who's actually telling you really good stuff. And so, you know, I'd, I'd write very nice letters back to him. The director would send him. And he actually flashed one up at the board, and I, start, I started laughing. He said, wait, wait a minute, have you seen this letter? <laughs> I said, yeah, I saw that letter. <laughs> he said, did you write that letter? <laughs> and I'm, I'm sitting about 20 rows back in the auditorium, smiling. Yeah, you know, it, there, there are a lot of brilliant guys on the outside doing really good work. And it, I, th I think this DES w was a really, really important good thing. It gave us all an opportunity to work together, to share in, in this knowledge, in the development. And there's been a lot of work since then, really good work, where, where people are having great ideas that, that we all benefit from. Uh, you know, for me, it's, we, we want to get secure stuff out there. We want to protect ourselves. And I, and I think it's, it only aids us all when we have more knowledge. But uh, this was one of the really, really exciting events. It brought the public in. It used a fairly, a fairly simple algorithm people could look at. Yeah, you, you, when you're talking about S boxes, uh, 0 to 15, people can see those numbers. They can understand them. It's not like you're using a permutation on 0 to 256. It's just too big and too complicated for people to look at. When you're talking about 0 to 15, people can look at it. They can see patterns. They can have ideas. Malin Doyle, when he was des designing things, Malin was the uh, best designer I ever knew. He always said, you know, I want to design my algorithm so that it's this much better than required. Because I know if it's this much better, you're not going to spend any time looking at it. You're going to go after somebody else's junk that you know you can beat. But if I tantalize you with something that's this much better, I know you're going to spend time looking at my thing. And I want you to try to evaluate my thing, because I want to know if there's something wrong with it. So that, that was kind of the golden rule. You don't try to hide, security, hide insecurity with complexity. You want it to be obviously secure. You don't want to make it a, a complexity problem. Spaghetti code, we used to call it. You want to, you want to be close. DES was close. You know, that, that differential cryptanalytic attack, that was just about exhaustion. A lot of text. Required a lot of text. A ton of text. But, uh, but it, was about ex it was about an exhaustion. It was, and it was really cool. Uh, this, this whole story was great. And I, I think it was a nice opportunity for the world to see, yeah, you know, NSA can play fair. When, when I was on, on the stage with, with, with uh, Adi and, uh, and, and Marty and, and, and Witt and, and Ron, uh, they said, did you think about hooking it? And I said, not for a second, because I knew I wasn't smart enough to build a hook in that you guys wouldn't find sometime in the next 15 years. And that was really true. That was, that was, that's the big story for, for crypto and NSA. We're smart enough to know we aren't smart enough to do that. And it, it, that's just not a good thing to do. The good thing to do is, doggone it, you build it right. And if we build it right and implement it right, the country wins. That, that's all it takes. Um, and you, you know, we, we got the best designers. We got the best developers in the world. That's how we win. That's how we got DES. That internet thing really kind of threw a monkey wrench in. But yeah, yeah. That was, that was, the, that was the one thing I didn't foresee. I knew we were giving them a good problem. But I thought people would be working in isolation. Doggone it. And they weren't. They were all working together. And what a tremendous boon that's been f for the world to be able to work on problems like that in, in a group. It's, it's really, really nice to see. So uh, they asked me what my biggest regret was when, when I saw the work was being done. And I said, my biggest regret is that you know, I got to write letters to Adi about his good ideas, but they weren't coming from me. I would have loved to be able to work with him. That would, have, that would have been a really cool thing for me. And I was stuck in this little closed, I, only, I had a thousand people to work with, but I didn't have him. And I think it would have, would have been really neat for me to, have, to be able to work with him. So that, that's the biggest regret that I have, is that we, we don't get to work with everybody. We, we are locked up by this classification system. Uh, 
I remember Brian Snow at one of the RSAs, they, they asked him if, if they thought NSA would stay ahead of the world in crypto. And he said, of course, because we get to see everything that everybody else publishes, and you don't get to see anything we publish. If we can't stay ahead of you, we really suck. <laughs> yes? Just to add to the record a little bit, Dickie, um, a number of places sort of extended the life of DES, or at least their use of it, with the uh, DES3. Um, any comments you want to make around that, please do. Sure. Uh, so triple DES, where you use three DESs together, and you, you, it, it's, it's nice for one reason. If you use the same variable to decrypt and encrypt and decrypt it, it's compatible with a single DES. It, it's, it's solid. It's a little bit longer. But w we got over worrying about the government using that by that time, so that was not a big deal for us. Uh, I, I don't think that the politicians foresaw that, and I don't think that, that the techies were, were thinking that was going to happen either, because we thought you know, this thing is going to last its five or six years and, and be replaced by something else, but not triple DES. The reason we didn't think triple DES was because of the efficiency. You know, it's, it's three times slower, and everybody's looking for faster, not slower. So, you know, you can, you can take almost any, any algorithm and, and run a thousand rounds on it, and you're probably okay. It's just that the, the, the throughput is going to be terrible. So, just, just as, a, as a side note, re remember when the call for DES came out, there, were only, there was only one real applicant for it. When the call for AES came out, and, and that one DES guy was a guy who'd worked with NSA on crypto. So, this was you know, not, not a pure commercial guy. But when AES came out, there were about 15 proposals. And they were almost all from private guys. In fact, the only one that really had anything wrong with it was the German government submission. All the private ones were good. And that shows how far the commercial world had come. Yes. Uh, Mike, please, because they're recording. I apologize. I'm probably the least intelligent person in this room, and I don't have the background in all the things you're talking about. I went to UCLA right after the ARPANET thing started. So, um, It sounds to me like you're talking about messages in your encryption, continuous conversation, the th same thing that the Internet grew up out of, Is that cr as opposed to single transactions. So, so DES could be used in any way, and most of it really was commercial stuff. It was banking stuff, so it was transactions and that kind of data. But it could have been used in any way, and probably was. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure conversations were But encrypted. doesn't a single transaction create a simpler base to where you can encrypt everything differently each time as long as you keep a record of how to decrypt that if it's needed? You mean change the crypto variable each time? Yep. Uh, not, not back then. Because changing the crypto, it's not like there, there was no RSA back then. Okay. So it was, it was but, but pull they, that paper they tape basically through. Basically, have different types of a, uh, the way you approach them, though. So you could do something like add a counter in each time, but nobody did. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, you're talking key management, and the world did not, much as they didn't understand crypto, they really didn't understand key management. But that's but, where the problem's growing up commercially today. Yeah, it Banks is. Banks can't keep you out of their storage records, uh, you can't protect a record from a merchant. Merchants are have to store all the stuff. The banks have to store all the stuff. Everything that goes on on the internet today has to be stored, and you can't use a single coding for that because if somebody figures out how to, I mean, this, this is the way it's, it's seeming to me. If somebody figures out the one log, they can get into everything. And yeah, but that, that, that key management is hard, though. It's really cumbersome for anybody to do. And so you, you have that trade-off. Uh, you also have to remember that if you've got something that's managing key, then that's going to be the target. They're not going after the data. They're going to go after the key management and go after that. So you've got to watch out for that. That's the, that's the real holy grail because if you get that, you can get everything. So uh, you also have to worry about if you're storing every, everything in a, in a huge database, well, yeah, you, you want to have different encryption for each one because you don't want to decrypt the whole thing to get to this thing. You want to go after it piece by piece. You want to go at piece so, by piece. So, yeah. Right. Okay. But back in the early days of DES, that wasn't the game. I the, fully under, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah the, the game was, I, I'll tell you, we, uh, we went to a bank in New York and they were saying, they were taking us through, saying and we're using DES for this here and we're using it back in this system here and we're using it here and we're using it here and we're using it here. And finally one of the guys said, well, that's, that's a lot of uses. What are you doing for key management? And the, the, uh, the security guy said, that's the good news. We don't need key management. It came with key. Which point you say, okay. <laughs> That's a true story, by the way. It's sad, but true. Uh, any questions? Re remember, this is being recorded. And any question you have, somebody else is going to wish somebody had asked. Not so much on DES, but do you have any comments about blockchain and Internet of Things and topics like that? as it relates to crypto. Yeah, I mean, inter Internet of Things is going to be a bear. You know, you've already got refrigerators that are spamming the world and uh, being parts of botnets. Uh, the medical devices, I think, are the most problematic because, as someone says, you, you, you've got a fibrillator in here. You don't want, the, you don't, don't want it password encrypted because if something goes wrong, you want that guy to be able to find out what's going on. You want anybody there to be able to find out what's going on. But that means it's got to be open so that anybody can also do anything. Uh, I was in a meeting the other day. It seems like, it seems like every, everybody in this blasted meeting, it was n not an APL meeting. It was a community thing that we're, we're putting on a cyber conference. Everybody there seemed to have some kind of a, a, a body pump that was giving them stuff for uh, some kind of a diabetic condition, type 2 diabetes or whatever. But they're all talking about that. And, Saying, well, you know, I, sometimes I set it for this insulin, sometimes I set it for that insulin. I'm thinking, you know, that, that changing that setting, if, if you can do that remotely, somebody else can do that remotely. And if you've got the wrong setting for the insulin you're getting, that's probably not a good situation. These, this stuff is really scary. Uh, it's also true that you know, well beyond DES now, uh, one of the things we're thinking about is what's next after RSA? If you believe in quantum computers, then you need to worry about that. And, and I think we do need to worry about that. And when I say we, it's not NSA. It's the world needs to worry about that. I was, I was talking to one of the guys who's a, a professor. He's saying, well, you know, it's, it, it's only the government that has this intelligence life. It will just wait until someone b really builds one, and then we'll, we'll change that stuff right away. And I said, you know, number one, you're not going to change it right away. It's, it's going to take a while. And number two, it's not true that only the government has intelligence life. You've got your health records, you've got your, your investment, your banking, all that stuff. But health in particular, you're, that stuff is not going to change over time. You've got to protect that. And you've got to understand that that's may, maybe not for me, but for my grandkids. Their, their health records are going to be important 50 years from now. Might be for me. See how lucky I am. Yeah, some of, the, some of the things on the Internet of Things are likely to remain unchanged for 15 or 20 years because they're built in to big devices. So I'm going to put you on the spot with two questions. Okay. The first one is, are you actually Satoishi Nakamoto? Perhaps. Good answer. Uh, and the, uh, for those of you who don't know, you can Google. Uh, and uh, the, the second one is... Um, uh, I'll state my opinion so it's on the record as well. Um, I think it is wrong to build in intentional weaknesses for law enforcement access to personal communications because that weakens everything and for all governments and that's not necessarily a good result. That's my opinion. Um, do you have anything you'd like to say on the subject? Sure. Um, you're, you're right. First, for a number of reasons. Uh, there's ubiquitous crypto out there. There's no way you're going to be able to design it so the bad guys are vulnerable. The, the really bad guys, you might be able to pick up some, some fool who's doing something, the, the little guy. You're not getting the big guys, you might get a little guy. But there's no question you're going to put everybody else at risk because you're not going to be able to con contain the access to that law enforcement field. Other governments are going to have it, even if it's only in the U.S., if you're going to give it to police departments, it's gone. All you're going to do is put the average citizen at risk. You're not, you're not really going to do anything beneficial for law enforcement, but you are going to pretty much put everybody else up the creek. So uh, 
e even if the government designs it, if, if you can't let commercial people design it. They will, they will screw it up. I get it. Back when we were doing th this, uh, this Kalia stuff, I used to see stuff from companies all the time, and I would beg them not to try to do it because they were totally incompetent at designing this stuff. They didn't have crypto guys. Even your big companies did not have crypto guys. I was on a, on a panel one time. It was a, they were talking to the uh, National Academy of Sciences, talking on development of, of workforce. And they wanted to know how many savvy cyber people, crypt, crypto cyber, cyber people, you had to have. And they asked me first. And I said, I'm Johns Hopkins, we have 5,000 people. I need 1,000 people that are really good. And I need everybody to be pretty good. They went to Cisco. They asked the Cisco guy, and he said, we've got 30,000 people. I need 300 of them to understand cybersecurity. I'm thinking, Cisco, you need 300 people? You've got to be kidding. You know, if it's not 15,000, you're not doing your job. So you know, to think they're going to do that. By the way, next guy was John Deere. He said, I have 60,000 people. I need 12 who know something about cyber. I said, 12? How do you keep your network up with 12? <laughs> yeah. I said, are your, I said, are your 12 any good? He said, I don't, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> How would I know? But, uh, by, by the way, John Deere is on campus today. They have a new brand new so, so, so there are plenty of jobs for cybersecurity guys. <laughs> exactly. Guess why they were on campus? To talk about cybersecurity. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I, I spent a long time talking to the guy, and he just said, you, you, you know, I don't have a threat model, and I've got to be able to sell it to the, to the board. And without any kind of a threat model, I can't convince them I need to spend money on cybersecurity. Jim. That was Jim. Jim who? Thompson. Yeah. So my question is, any predictions on when we should start worrying about quantum computers that could actually break for real crypto? crypto? Yeah, you know, that is such a good question. Um, it seems like about 30 years ago, I was told they were 20 years away. And 10 years ago, I was told the same thing. Yeah, we keep hearing it's 20 years away. I don't know if we ever get there. But if we don't get there, it'll be f for one of two reasons. Something better happened, or there's no commercial market for it. Because right now, it's not much good for anything but, but that, that. We don't have a lot of algorithms. All the algorithms that seem to be very efficient will solve that kind of problem. So uh, NSA has already come out and said that we should start thinking about the follow-on. So I think that that's good advice. The, fo the follow-on to RSA. They, sh they should start thinking about what is going to c replace it for the world. Because NSA right now is using commercial stuff almost exclusively. Even the stuff they build themselves is called Sweet B, which is still exactly the same algorithms that are used in the commercial stuff. So we, it's not going to be NSA coming up with a government version. It's going to be we as a country, maybe we as a, as a world, need to come up with the next one. Is it lattice-based? I don't know. The problem with lattice-based is it looks good. But how much work has really been done? You know, it hasn't been labeled as the answer yet. And when it's labeled as the answer, that's when you're going to get the really good work on it. Until people think it's, it's the problem to solve, you aren't going to get people trying to solve it. Yeah, but I was going to say that quantum will, will break all the public key crypto, but symmetric keys. I mean, you're still not going to break AES with. So, uh, so quantum, it's, right? it, it helps. I mean, it takes it down to. Basically, the square root. But square root of huge. Well, the square, huge. so it takes it from 256 to, to 128. Yeah. But there's also a big coefficient outside. So it's, so it's a lot of work times 2 to the, to the 128, whereas opposed to a little work times 2 to the 256. It's, it's, it's still around 2 to the 192. So yeah, this, the symmetric stuff is good. And maybe we just go back to the 70s when we use symmetric to rekey symmetric. Yeah, you can do that. Well, I, I want to lead you to, uh, when I asked about IoT, I was thinking of a lightweight crypto and ask for any speculation you have on the viability. Some people say if I can do an IP stack, I can do crypto. If others say not. You want to speculate on that? So uh, th there actually has been work on lightweight crypto, and they're trying to come up with something that might be a, a good standard. Uh, I, think it, I think it's a good problem because 
with, with these with the little devices, the stuff they're putting in refrigerators, there's not a lot of horsepower there. Now, it could be by the time they come up with something, there'll be a lot more horsepower there. You, you know, when you think about what's in your watch compared to what was in uh, a computer in the IAD 30 years ago, it's, it's about the same. So it could be, could be the refrigerator is going to be smart as a, as a car that can drive itself. Well, hopefully the refrigerator doesn't leave the house, but... <laughs> But it could have that kind of horsepower in it. Okay, thank you very much.